Remarkable Network Initiative and um, also to Google on uh, free expression um, and other issues. I'll be moderating um, this uh, event this afternoon, this workshop. Um, you have the title uh, in front of you. Um, so uh, let me uh, introduce the panel. I think it's probably best um, that I introduce them uh, when they speak, because we've got a large panel. Everybody is going to be speaking for a maximum of five minutes, no longer, and um, we'll keep timing strict so that we've got time for uh, interchange and for Q&A uh, with everybody here. This workshop's a collaboration between uh, the GNI, Index on Censorship, and the Center for Strategic and Policy Analysis in Pakistan. Um, and we're, we're aiming to discuss some of the most pressing issues at the, in at the intersection of the internet um, telecommunications and um, human rights. So uh, without any further ado, I hand over the floor to Ross Young from Google. Hello, uh, my name is Ross Young, I'm from Google. I uh, manage uh, policy issues in New Zealand, which isn't particularly known for oppression unless you count um, ravenous sheep moving around the country. Um, but uh, what I'd like to do is, uh, in, in the short time we have available, is just uh, take you through um, some new tools, actually. Um, you probably know that, that Google is relatively active in um, uh, explaining the impact of uh, how limitations of freedom of expression um, affect people and also affect social and economic growth. Uh, and we find that is, is quite an important thing to explain. Um, and you see that in, in a variety of uh, contexts, whether it be uh, in trade agreements or elsewhere, that it's important that people understand that expression is not simply for political speech, but also for education and business transactions as well. And that context is particularly important. What I'd like to take you through quite uh, briefly, um, in case you're not aware of, is uh, three tools. Um, and if we could bring up the first one, which is Constitute. This is a tool that was launched a few weeks ago, and it's a rights-based initiative. It provides a searchable comparison of all the world's written constitutions. Um, we'll add some of the uh, uh, ones that are in multiple documents later. And it allows you to compare different countries' approach to different human rights, including um, freedom of expression. Uh, it includes the constitutions that were in force um, uh, in September 2013 uh, for nearly ind every independent state in the world. Could we bring up the website, please? Um, Constitute, if you could click through to that, please. Oh. Sorry, I thought I sent the email through so you could bring it up. Um, uh, so if you want to look, um, everyone who's got their computer at the moment can look at Constitute Project um, and uh, have a look at that there. Uh, they, they will be building this uh, soon. It was developed with the Comparative Constitutions Project. Uh, Google Ideas seeded it with a grant um, uh, to the University of Texas in Austin, um, and it's been quite useful. Uh, okay, we might just go through to the digital attack map, then if it's taking a while. Um, uh, the digital attack map is um, a new uh, tool that was launched yesterday um, or the day before. Uh, this is a live data visualization built through collaboration between Arbor Networks and Google Ideas. So if you want to have a look yourself right now, you can go to um, digitalattackmap.com. Attack this provides a live um, uh, map of uh, DDoS attacks currently occurring. It's uh, pretty impressive, um, I, and it also gives a timeline as well where you can see the attacks occurring over time. And it breaks it down. You can see um, those attacks that originate from one country and uh, where the destination in, is in another country. For some of them, it's unable to identify that because of geolocation, uh, uh, and so that prevents um, some difficulty as well. So maybe we can bring up, if we just type in the URL, www.digitalattackmap.com. Oh, well. 
Um, but you can look it on your online devices, um, which you've probably got. Okay, that's Project Shield. Well, we'll just go on to that now. Um, so, uh, obviously, we've got um, DDoS attacks occurring, um, which, uh, as many of you will know, is um, uh, when websites are overwhelmed with, um, uh, with attacks, um, they can't handle that, and they have to bring them, bring them down. So, uh, actually, if we are able to, are you able to flip to... Um, Yeah. Can you just can you just recap on on the slides very quickly, you guys? Just can you can you take it to? Can, you just, can we we just run through them very the very digital quickly? attack map? No, that's constitute <laughs> the other side. The third one. You know, Ross, what we might do yeah, is we'll let's. Shall we recap on all of yep. this right at the end of the seven? Yeah. You guys, can you get? Go, we're going to go through that again at the end, very briefly, of one minute at the end of the presentations in half an hour's time. Can you get get it sorted before then? Yeah. Yeah, Ross, do you want to go and yeah, sort, no, sort I, that? They've got it there now. Yeah. It just took some time. Okay. That's fine. Fine. So we're going to go through. Um, the, the three tools uh, at the end of the, the seven presentations. But for the moment, um, thanks very much, uh, Ross. Uh, second speaker and one of the sponsors, uh, one of the participants for uh, this panel is uh, uh, Zahid Jamil from CSPA in Pakistan. Zahid, do you have a... Hi, guys. Um, thank you for being here. I know we have limited time. I'm going to try to focus on the points I wanted to make quickly. Uh, the purpose of oppression over the network and the internet was was actually an idea that that um, you know, Gina obviously collaborated after, but we had uh, proposed it, and apparently, at least one government that I know of didn't like the idea of having this sort of a title. So I'm really happy to see that at least we were able to get it onto the agenda of the IGF. And I want to focus on the the issue for our perspective from a developing country uh, on policy issues. What the problem is that we see developing in our region. And we feel that it's becoming not just national, regional, but is now going to grow internationally, which is this concept of a deliberalization of the telecom infrastructure that is taking place in many countries. Uh, the, the benefits of liberalization that took place you know, after 1999, et cetera, the GATS agreement, and all those implementations where now everybody's talking about how wonderful ICTs are, are seeing a deliberalization or reversal, 180 degree turn in many regions. We're seeing that the number of telecom providers is decreasing. The number of ISPs is decreasing in our country. For instance, we were at 250, now we're down to something that I can count on, the, on one hand one fi with my fingers, the number of ISPs that we have. So it's affecting competition because large players, and I'll give you an example from our country, for instance, our telecom operator was acquired by Etisalat as, as a player. It's not just a national, it's, it's, it's a government-owned big telecom company that has, is regional, in fact, in, in, in the South Asia and other re in our near regions came in and basically took over. Um, there are issues about whether they've even paid for it, et cetera, that's a different matter. But the fact that they've been able to come in and eat up the competition has been interesting in the things that they've been able to provide to the government. For instance, they sort of suggested that maybe one of the things we want to do is have something called an international clearinghouse for international calls, which meant that all LDI operators who were terminating calls from abroad to Pakistan were asked to suspend operations. Don't do it anymore. We will take all of you place it in our data center in one place, we'll do it, Etisalat will do it, and you don't have to have any operational costs, no employees, nothing. You just have a license because you're an LDI operator, and we'll give you the money. By the way, in addition to that, what we'll do is we'll take the cost, which used to be, say, about, say, you know, uh, 10 cents a minute, and we'll jack it up to 80 cents, and even further. And suddenly, calling Pakistan became eight time, 800 times more expensive from, say, the US or other places. That sort of deliberalization was incredible. And this is not just a anecdote. Guess what? The FCC took notice of this in the States and said, well, this is not on, and they stopped payments to the Pakistan route. Thank God for that. We, our competition commission took note of that. But the trouble was that when these organizations come in in this fashion, they actually are, the people who represent the ministry happens to be their lawyer in court. What are you going to do? Those sort of problems. But that's just one example. 
you have further control, for instance, that is taking place. They are now saying, well, we now own the infrastructure. What else can we possibly do? Guess what? You have the same values we do, because we're from the South, we're from Asia, maybe because we share the same religion or whatever. Let's try and help you filter. So we will give you $30 million worth of software and infrastructure for free to block certain content. Government of Pakistan goes, fabulous. Yes, it's for free. Let's do it. What do they get as a benefit of that? They don't just allow the filtering, but now they're surveying. Now they have surveillance on every single citizen of Pakistan. There is no legislation, no regulation, no control about how they're supposed to do it. And the next stage which they plan to do is then say, all right, now next, I know you're using Skype. I know you're using YouTube. Uh, OTT, over the top, I will decide how much you pay. I'll send you a bill saying that this is the amount of usage of YouTube you did this month. That's the bill you're going to pay me. And that's, uh, you know, you can, I, I don't even have to go into the issues of privacy and a whole bunch of different issues that that involves. So the usage is not going to be charged. So these are the kind of things that we're seeing in a regional basis and the deliberalization across the world. And nobody's screaming GATS violation, GATS violation, WTO violation. And this is not just impacting a trade issue, but it's impacting the accessibility, the availability, and the digital divide, specifically. And the ability of a diaspora abroad, as another example of the ICH of Pakistan, trying to be able to call and communicate. It was, became a political issue. Where can we address these? The FCC is just a national response in the US. We need to figure out places where these sort of oppressive regimes or regulations, or whatever you want to call it, need to be addressed. We keep talking about, at the ITU, the accounting problems of the one horrible people from the West who are gaining money from this. OK, I understand that. But what about the trouble that this is creating? Where will this be addressed? When will this be on agenda? Which forum will this be dealt with? And how and when will we resolve this? And so my question as I close my, inter my initial remarks is that we need to find a place where we can have a globally united coalescing on these issues so we can deal with it. Whether it's the ITU, whether it's someplace else, whether it's at the IGF, but we need to start discussing this because the ball doesn't come, roll in one direction, it can also roll in another. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Zahid. Some food for thought on the, the nexus uh, between commercial, commercial profit surveillance um, and human rights in, in Pakistan. I'm sure there'll be questions um, on that. Our third speaker um, is Liesl Brunner. Um, for those of you who uh, may not be aware, and I assume uh, most people are, um, in I think it was in uh, April, wasn't it, Liesl? The um, uh, industry dialogue uh, began a collaboration with uh, the GNI. Um, Liesl will give details of the industry dialogue, but it is um, a new form of working with um, a group of uh, telcos, uh, predominantly um, in Europe, um, but elsewhere, to working with the Global Network Initiative. Liesl. Thanks. So I'll talk a little bit about um, how a group of telecommunications companies are dealing with uh, freedom of expression and privacy in relation to uh, their interactions with governments. Um, in mid-2001, or 2011, when the UN Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights were launched, a group of telecommunications companies came together to talk about how these principles could be implemented in the telecommunications sector, and in particular with regard to freedom of expression and privacy. Um, some of these companies had had experience in difficult situations um, in Egypt with the internet shutdown, in um, situations involving surveillance in Eastern Europe and Iran, and they realized that the way to address these issues was collectively, that um, when you interact with governments collectively, it is a much stronger message than when you speak with one voice, that uh, when you share best practices among different companies, um, everyone learns from this experience. And so in March of this year, the telecommunications industry dialogue was officially launched. Um, it has a set of guiding principles that are based on the UN guiding principles on business and human rights. And uh, we also announced a two-year collaboration with the Global Network Initiative, um, a multi-stakeholder organization that has significant expertise in freedom of expression and privacy. During these two years, um, the two groups will look at the way forward and share learning and discuss best practices on how to uh, protect the people's rights to freedom of expression and privacy, um, to find answers to the question, what does a telecommunications company do 
when it faces a government request to take an action that could have a negative impact on its customers' rights to freedom of expression or privacy. Um, and we're also finding ways to engage stakeholders in uh, having this conversation and dealing with these issues. And um, we launched our website last week, and we look forward to further engagement with stakeholders. And I'll leave it there and look forward to your comments and questions. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Liesl. Uh, now we'll have two perspectives from geographically um, disparate regions, but uh, two uh, emerging um, powers. Uh, beginning here, right on our doorstep um, with Indonesia, um, ICT Watch, and uh, Donny Biu. Donny. Well, okay. Uh, thank you very much for uh, having me here. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, first of all, so maybe I want to uh, give them some of the example that is pragmatically is become some cases in Indonesia. So, okay, uh, maybe I want to use the uh, presentation. So my time is only five minutes. That's enough. Okay, so if you go to downstairs, we have a booth, I still have a booth, and we develop, uh, we, we pre produce uh, four postcards in our booth, and I still was. For, uh, this postcard about the freedom of expression, uh, the, uh, and the censorship protecting you from reality, and also uh, this uh, postcard. So, actually, in Indonesia, we have, in my opinion, we have two, two main uh, challenge in terms of freedom of expression. One is we still have a defamation online article. So, last, uh, last month, one of the Twitter users being detained and his hair is being cut clean because he tweet uh, that one of the Mem uh, parliament members uh, did a corruption and is reported to the police and detained uh, for one, one, one day. One day is enough because it's like, you know, for the chilling e effect for the freedom of expression. The other is about the filtering or censorship itself. So I don't want to elaborate, I don't want to elaborate the, the, the defamation online because it will be another cases. So I want to uh, share you about the, how the Indonesian uh, internet being a filter. You can see in the downstairs as well, we have an MCIT booth, which is they promote, which is, they, they start with good intention, you know, to, to block the illegal content, which is, is fine. And they say this is trust positive uh, mechanism. And this is, well, I, I, I really, don't know about these technical things, but it's only about this, the uh, trust positive mechanism. But the interesting is about the policy itself. Uh, before, uh, I mean, uh, before last month, before last month, this is the trust positive, and this is the internet service provider in Indonesia. And trust positive is not a mandatory at all. So trust positive is like a database contain the blacklisted website and developed by the MCIT government, by the government, by the MCIT. That's not mandatory at all. So only several ISP use that kind of uh, database, this ISP. So it's not, I mean, it's okay. Several ISP not block their website. The green one is not blocked. We have 150 ISPs in Indonesia. 150 ISP Indonesia. Several block, several ISP do the block, several using their own system. Okay. And this is the draft of the ministerial decree. Um, last two weeks, I, we have like a discussion with the, the ministerial. It, it is not, not re released, it's only a draft. But from this draft, we can. Uh, get an overview how the government um, uh, see the, the, the internet access. So 
this uh, this this um, this is a minister decree about how to control the negative content of the website. In the in the minister decree, it says that trust positive is become a mandatory. It's still a draft. Don't worry, no worry. For a while. So every ISP have to use the database from trust positive, which is, is developed by the government. If the ISP have already established their own uh, filter mechanism, they have to have also have trust positive database as a fundamental as basic. And this is an example how uh, the 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 the, uh, the page when some block is, uh, some website is blocked, the, the 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 logo will be displayed. That's positive. I will show you some legal or legitimate content that missed block by the ISP. For example, ILGA, ILGA is for the uh, Inter International Lesbian and Gay Association and Malas Banget is for the youth, for the youth uh, website, I will show you. This is the Our Voice is for the um, LGBT movement in Indonesia and Car Free Day. I will show the example. So. Why the malasbanget.com is being blocked? This is the engine from the Trust Positive. And you can see males, males.net, males18, males free, males and males, males, males banget. So they miss block because they contain the uh, males. Uh, Donny, could, could you wrap up and then okay. we can come back to the, uh, the details sure, sure. in later point. Okay, and uh, I will show the, the address. Uh, this is this. Okay, this is the, the most interesting one. I will show you. Okay, to, uh, no, it's a website. This is the Car Free Day, which is his content, legitimate content. It's about the, the content, uh, it's okay. But it's being blocked last month. Why it's being blocked? Because uh, according to Internet Archive, if you see 10 years ago, what is content 10 years ago? This one. This is the same domain name, but last 10 years ago, but still on the database. So, you know, it's about uh, the SOP is not clear, but, you know, you, you can, we, we can discuss later about, 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 about it later. Thank you. Right. I can see, I can see what was the headline of the, of, of the draft legislation. What was it? C control of negative content. Well, I mean, you know, there we are. Um, right. Uh, Lots of questions and lots of practical questions back for you, Donny, um, afterwards. Um, from Chile, from Derechos Digitales, uh, Claudio Ruiz. Claudio. Oh, thank you. Um, um, I would like to share with you uh, a little bit of perspective of a regional scope over these issues. Um, I'm from Latin America, where we have a lot of experience over legislative approach on the internet agenda. Uh, in most of the cases, sadly, in a very bad way. Actually, uh, less than a month ago, in the case of Peru, they have approved a cybercrime regulation with less than five hours of discussion into the Congress, and which has a, a very, very uh, complicated issues there, uh, moreover, of the goodwill that it has been driven. But, what I really wanted to share with you in this, you know, three and a half minute that I have, uh, it's just trying to think about the, uh, how the IS, the I, uh, the technology agenda and the internet freedom agenda has been driving into the region. And I would like what I need, what I know the most actually into the region it is the Chilean case. And as you may know, uh, Chile was one of the first first countries in, into the in the world to have a net neutrality regulation uh, in our. Uh, Telecommunications Act, and at the same time, Chile is quite well known, but not so much as uh, it will. But about the ISP liability provision that we have uh, in uh, because of the last reform to our Copyright Act, uh, which is quite interesting in the way that balances quite well, in my perspective, the human rights provision and needs and uh, the need to balance the copyright, which is, of course, when you're talking about the internet, quite difficult, actually. But what I wanted to share with you, there's three ideas uh, related with this. The first one is, uh, despite as you 
uh, can think. These two uh, provisions, the net neutrality regulation, uh, INC is one of the first in, in the world, and the ISP liability was not government-driven and was not Congress-driven even. These two provisions was uh, possible because of the pressure of the civil society on this matter. You know, in the case of the Copyright Act, for instance, there was the pressure of a lot of uh, people involved there, including us at Derecho Digitales, including the Librarians Association, and so on, and companies, of course. And in the case of the ne uh, Net Network Neutrality Act, or reform to the Telecommunications Act, was because of other civil society uh, organizations that pre put pressure. Uh, into the Congress to just get these laws into it. So my first idea is that uh, somehow these quite interesting reforms or this quite interesting approach to the law on the internet matters. Uh, it's not government driven, at least in the case of Chile, besides of the fact of this uh, pretty interesting approach, uh, but uh, civil society uh, pressure, this was because of the was made. But the second idea, it's in the case of Chile, uh, and related with the, the, with the first point, of course, it's uh, my, my, one of the, the, the worst things that we have on the ISD policy uh, realm is the lack of an agenda, of a digital agenda, that at somehow can drive all this process, or this legislative process, over a more you know, gener uh, general approach. And this is very sad, and I can actually talk for, you know, for, for all the weekend if you want it. But I know I have like 30 seconds left. Um, and the third idea, it's uh, one of the most important problem that problems that we are facing right now, actually. Um, if we take into account the ISP liability, for instance, provision that we have, which I'm pretty proud of it, and, uh, and we, we see what, is the, what has been the, the reaction of this provision uh, after the, the reform of the Copyright Act, we can see as the, the United States influence has been quite important there to just uh, have a very negative approach to it. Because the, the USDR mainly, I'm not uh, talking about the states of course in, in, a, in a general way, but the USDR specifically has been quite, in, uh, uh, quite aggressive over this reform because they, see, they say that this is against the FDA that we have with the states, which is not. Um, and they are uh, constantly put, it, put us in this priority watch list that they, the 301 report that they have, which has been kind quite of dif difficulty in the, inter in, the, in, the, um, uh, in the internal policy way when we're talking, trying to talk about you know, the balancing, the copyright uh, issues and stuff. And the second idea is that right now we're, our government is uh, part of the TPP regulations, where the USTR are, of course, uh, against uh, all this kind of balancing agenda of the copyright issues and freedom of expression in a general way. And I think it's important to just and somehow balancing that kind of approach. I think one of the most important uh, difficulties that we have right now, it's about this kind of influence in our you know, internal agenda. Moreover, the civil society as kind of pushing for a more progressive agenda. At the same time, our government is trying to uh, restrict uh, on the trade agenda, on the trade base basis, this important uh, internet freedom kind of regulations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so the US government in uh, a number of ways, but in one way in particular is in the eye of the storm. So we're very grateful that um, <laughs> Scott Busby, as ever, State Department, um, uh, doing uh, uh, or trying to do the good cop side of things. Um, <laughs> so uh, over to you, Scott. Thank you, John. Uh, Claudio, you're the third person today who's mentioned the, tr the problems that we're creating with our trade agreements. And I must say that uh, uh, we have not, and my branch the State Department, focused on this as, uh, so much. So we are going to take these comments we've heard today and go back and try to do better in terms of uh, incorporating um, a freedom of expression provisions into these trade agreements along with whatever IP protections uh, are deemed necessary. Uh, very happy to be here and represent the United States. It was a, a challenge getting here because of our government shutdown, but thank you. We got the approval in the end. Um, let me just say, first off, um, uh, in a global sense, uh, we in the State Department and the U.S. government as a whole remain very committed to freedom of expression issues generally, including uh, internet freedom. Uh, unfortunately, we continue to observe, as many as you have, that in the wake of the Arab Spring, there's a crackdown on freedom of expression generally, both on the internet and off the internet, uh, be it in China with this new law against uh, rumor mongering, which is essentially a, 
uh, crack down against anyone who's distributing any information that's critical of the government. In Vietnam, with the recent Decree 72 uh, also imposing restrictions on the internet, uh, as well as uh, imprisonment of bloggers. Uh, in the Middle East, in countries like Pakistan, we're seeing a greater enforcement of blasphem blasphemy laws. Uh, in Latin America, in Ecuador, Venezuela, uh, laws that are restricting independence of the media. So unfortunately, some of the restrictions being discussed vis-a-vis -vis the internet uh, are emblematic of uh, general restrictions we're seeing on uh, freedom of expression. Uh, several of the speakers have referenced the digital divide. Indeed, we agree that that's an important issue to address, but we think it's important to recognize two digital divides. One is the access divide, uh, 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 in which we still have millions, if not billions, of people who still don't even have access to the internet and the types of technology that allow folks to communicate. Uh, we're doing our best to try to address that divide. But I think it's important for us to also remember uh, the freedom divide. Uh, uh, those who do have technical access to the internet but who are denied such access uh, in places like China, Iran, uh, and Cuba. And the importance of dress addressing that freedom divide uh, Freedom House, as many of you know, has issued its most recent uh, Freedom on the Net report, which uh, unfortunately documents the ways in which uh, f uh, access to the internet, uh, uh, b based on really p for political reasons, uh, is, uh, is being denied. Um, one uh, means that we think uh, can help to address this is the so-called Freedom Online Coalition, of which we were a founding partner. 21 governments who have come together to try and address uh, these challenges, both diplomatically and programmatically. Uh, Estonia is the newest uh, chair of this Freedom Online Coalition, and uh, we will be convening in Tallinn in April and developing an agenda uh, for the Freedom Online Coalition. And we're looking forward to getting contributions from civil society to formulate that agenda. So we very much would like your uh, ideas on what we should be doing. We've already gotten a few good ideas today on that. Um, last, lastly, let me touch on an issue which many have addressed uh, at this IGF, and that's the uh, role of multiple stakeholders in the global conversation on internet issues. Uh, we have seen, unfortunately, since the last IGF, uh, instances in which uh, the multi-stakeholder model has not been uh, respected, uh, in particular, uh, the wicket negotiations of this past year uh, demonstrated that governments are dealing in different ways with uh, engagement with multiple stakeholders. We in the U.S. thought it was extremely important to engage civil society both before, during, and after the wicket in developing our policy positions uh, uh, in terms of our positions in the negotiations there. Other governments like Kenya adopted a similar model, but unfortunately there were many governments that didn't take uh, that approach, that felt it was up to governments alone to develop their positions uh, going into the negotiations. Uh, so we think it's absolutely critical that in uh, our engagement on internet issues that uh, all governments uh, look to civil society as critical uh, voices uh, within the development of uh, governmental positions. And we'd urge all of you, uh, those of you from civil society, those of you from governments, uh, to do uh, your utmost to try to incorporate uh, the diverse views of stakeholders in, uh, in those negotiations. Uh, so let me leave it at that. Uh, you all know that we have significant challenges in the U.S. right now, uh, kind of squaring uh, our surveillance policies and practices uh, with our internet freedom agenda. I think we're in the process of doing that. President Obama has uh, created a uh, review board at it, who is looking at um, uh, reforms that we can undertake on our surveillance uh, uh, policies and practices. Uh, by the end of this year, we hope there will be recommendations from that board and th that uh, there will be new government policies in this. But we would urge all of you from wherever you come to ask your own governments what their policies and practices are on these issues. A lot of scrutiny on the US now, deservedly so, 
uh, but as I heard from a group of activists earlier today, most governments are not willing to talk about these things. Most governments don't have congressional oversight or judicial oversight of these matters. And I think it's time now to have a global conversation about what all governments are doing in this space. My hope is that uh, after this review process that we're engaged in, the U.S. will be able to stand up and say, we've gone through some difficult, a difficult period here, uh, but we've adopted some policies and procedures that we think uh, other countries uh, should, uh, should adopt as well. So I'm happy to hear others' comments and concerns on that. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Scott. Um, you, your concluding remarks took the words out of my mouth and I'm sure out of the mouths of, um, uh, of many of our participants here and um, I'm sure there'll be more, more follow-up um, on that and on the points that you and others have raised. Our final speaker is Mike Harris from uh, the London-based um, Index on Censorship where um, I used to be. Um, over to you, Mike. Um, I'm going to start by saying something and you've got to try not to laugh, but I actually think the IGF is really important. And it's really important because it's one of the very few occasions where civil society gets to engage directly with government and directly with business. We don't often have parallel conversations direct between civil society and government and business. And this is one of the few occasions in which we get to directly challenge or directly have, a, have conversations with. And I want to draw a divide between multi-stakeholderism, which is something that we all, well, most of us, uh, believe strongly in, and the power of collective or individual action. And we've seen from uh, the Edward, Edward Snowden revelations that occasionally we have these multi-stakeholder processes, but often there's stuff that we don't know as civil society. It's often stuff that we don't know as business. And so there's also a role, an important role, for individual action the action of whistleblowing, the action of calling on power. Now, the US shutdown showed that the Constitution has been directly developed to curtail executive power. The US Constitution was, in its, when it was envisaged, when it was drawn up, they wanted to put a curtailment on uh, executive power so they couldn't have a monarch. But, and Scott said that the US government's willing to talk about surveillance, but we weren't talking about surveillance until Edward Snowden leaked a number of top secret documents that showed the enormous scale of US surveillance, perhaps not of US citizens, but certainly of citizens of every other country on earth. And as a global forum, we should be really concerned about surveillance because if, if we don't take this seriously now, we give an opportunity and if we don't draw a line in the sand, we give an opportunity to China, we give an opportunity to other countries to justify their own far more pervasive surveillance systems. And the chilling effect on freedom of expression will be absolutely huge if we do not get this right, and we get it right now. But we've got to ask ourselves, why was it only one contractor, one whistleblower, Edward Snowden? Where was the individual responsibility of the other thousands of contractors or NSA employees? to say, hang on a minute, this actually might be unconstitutional. This may go against the Fourth Amendment. So I think collectively also we've got to send out a message that as participants in the IGF, as civil society and as other groups, that we all have an individual responsibility, whether we're working for government, whether we're working for corporations, whether we're working for civil society, to make sure that we do hold uh, power to account, that we do uphold the values and the founding values of the internet, and we do uphold universal human rights standards. There's also, how do we tackle oppression online when it comes from small private sector players? So for example, Gamma International developed a product called Finn Fisher. Finn Fisher is used against human rights activists in Belarus, in Azerbaijan, and in Bahrain. It's software that hacks your operating system takes your and can take control of your mobile phone or take control of your laptop. What is the responsibility of corporations to stop this software from being from, from working, from being able to infiltrate your laptop? And are these corporations doing enough? Are Microsoft doing enough to make sure their operating system is resilient against these sorts of hacks that really do compromise the work of human rights defenders. It's a very complicated 
question, but I think there needs to be more working between private sector organisations and civil society so that we can, we can break this problem. On um, telcos, I mean, telcos are doing a lot to um, implement the Rugi principles and to uphold uh, basic values of freedom of expression and privacy. But it's still the case that across the world, their uh, equipment that can be used for surveillance has been exported to some of the most authoritarian countries on earth. And I'm going to give a plug to a report, uh, False Freedom, on internet freedom in Azerbaijan. I've got colleagues from Azerbaijan just in the second row. This report shows how telecoms equipment sold by Telesonaria, a Swedish firm, has been used to record and survey um, uh, the, the, the mobile phones of dissidents in Azerbaijan. And this is happening day-to-day -day basis. This is Western companies selling this technology, knowing that it may be used against people that are fighting for their right to freedom of expression. How do we hold those companies to account? But also there's one final point, which is about legal frameworks in democracies. We've spoken a lot about online crime, about DDoS attacks. It's interesting that often attacks that take place online are punished in a different way from attacks that take place offline. So, for example, in the next couple of weeks, there's going to be an attempt to occupy Parliament Square in London. Lots of protesters are going to go down. They're going to block the roads. Now, on the whole, those people are going to be given a little slap on the wrist. And if you're, you know, if you're very unlucky, you might get an £80 fine and a night in prison. If you, for instance, did a DDoS attack on the Department of Work and Pensions website, you would probably end up spending a very long time in prison as a result of that, even if you take it offline for 30 seconds, one minute. So we do treat online crimes and offline crimes in a slightly different way. And what are the ways in which we can evaluate and be proportionate about harm? So that's just a final thought. I'm not saying that we should in any way tolerant, uh, tolerate DDoS attacks, as it is a huge problem. It's often used against civil society activists. But it's interesting about how do we balance laws online and offline, and is that balance right? OK, th thanks, Mike. Uh, just before I throw it open to the floor, we've got a pretty full house, and I, I imagine there's um, a, a lot of good questions and observations, and I want to then start an interchange between our panellists. I just wanted uh, you guys, if you, can you get the, those original slides up and to give Ross sort of one minute total just to go back on the, th the three Google tools? Have you got them or, or not? That was, the, that was the third one. If you it? go to, actually, the, probably, the, the, if you just pause on that one. So this is um, the digital attack map. Um, and you'll see that this is live. And this is um, DDoS attacks, so um, when people uh, try and bring down websites. And you can see in the US is where most of the attacks are occurring at the moment. The top part you will see uh, where you can't see the origin. It's because um, they're unable to identify which country the attack is originating from. You will see other arcs, say from China to the US, um, or from, uh, I think is it Vietnam to Brazil, where you can identify the origin and the destination of the attack. This is occurring in live time. Uh, at the bottom of the page, is a timeline and you'll see peaks. And at that point, you can actually look back over the weeks and months of where the key uh, attacks are occurring, uh, or have occurred, I should say. And uh, it's, it's quite, a useful, quite a useful tool. So that really gives you a flavor in real time of the types of attacks that are occurring, uh, to the extent that they can identify where they originate and the size of the impact as well. So it's quite a, a useful tool. The second thing I just wanted to mention briefly is, is uh, it's all very good saying that these attacks are occurring and where, but what can you do about it? So there's a new tool called Project Shield. And this is a, an initiative that enables people to leverage Google's technology to better protect their own websites. And that, I. In other words, their websites that may be taken offline because of these DDoS attacks, they can now use Google technology to help protect this. 
Now, this is uh, still in the testing phase. We're inviting um, webmasters uh, serving independent news, human rights, and election-related content uh, sites to apply to join the next round of trusted testers. So if you're interested um, in uh, doing that, you can go to Project Shield, um, and there's a short video there that uh, you can look at that. Thanks very much. Did you have the freedom of expression, Matt? That was the third one, or is, is uh, the Project there? Shield? That's the the third one the, there. Right. Right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I just thank you all seven uh, participants. I just uh, I thought there were three um, uh, dichotomies or three uh, three questions that might be worth um, uh, eking out a little bit more. One is obviously um, as as ever comes up uh, at IGF, the multi-stakeholder model. Um, versus the, the governmental ITU model that several speakers um, have spoken about. One is the universality of the web versus, uh, as, as others in different regions have alluded to, um, sort of the nationalization um, of the web. I was, uh, as others may have been, uh, I was at the Seoul uh, Cyberspace Conference last week and um, one Chinese delegate was talking about cyber autonomy with um, great uh, conviction. Um, and the third one that, again, um, has been spoken about is how do you reconcile a commitment to freedom of expression with a practice of extensive surveillance? And there are others um, besides. But there are, um, so let's see uh, some questions. And if you direct your questions to one or maximum, uh, you got, where are the mics on the floor? Yeah, there's one, is there one, one is, it, is there just one microphone? Okay, thanks. Um, if you direct your questions to one or two people and then maximum, no, just here in the middle, please, and then the gentleman there um, towards the side a second, and then I'll make sure that all the participants, um, okay, there, there, and then uh, uh, the two uh, towards the back. Uh, we'll take those four together, yeah. Um, my question is to Mr. Seth from uh, the uh, Department of State, is that right? Yeah. Just introduce yourself. I'm uh, Reem Al-Masri from uh, Jordan, and um, I'm, I, I'm talking from uh, a position of somebody who works in a censored website in Jordan, and uh, I appreciate the United States' concern over freedom of expression in other developing countries, but uh, I feel like it's really hard for me now to make the distinction between democratic and undemocratic countries when it comes to um, uh, the different repressive uh, actions online, especially after the US revelations, uh, US NSA revelations that are happening. Um, I, I want to tell you how these revelations are actually oppressing my freedom in my country because nowadays I feel that I can't really use the internet free freely knowing that the US on my actions online, one, and then that the U United States government is actually setting the bar for uh, governments like the Jordanian government uh, when it comes to uh, surveillance issues. So, for example, they say, uh, look how the United States is doing it, which is like, th that keep preaches, preaching democracy, so why can't we do it the same as the United States is doing it? Uh, that was um, very similar to a point um, uh, another Jordanian uh, activist made at a, at a big tent that I was hosting in Tunis at the Freedom Online back in June, the, the question of how do you distinguish now between democratic um, and uh, non-democratic states. And, and that person then was saying uh, that she worked from the assumption that all her traffic had been directed by the US government back to the Jordanian government. Thank you for raising that concern. It's one that I've heard multiple times over the course of the IGF, and I'll take that back to the State Department. I do think it's important to recognize kind of the limited purposes for which, uh, well, first of all, let me say that I'm not a representative of the NSA, and nor am I fully aware of everything that the NSA is, <laughs> is doing. Um, uh, uh, but as we've in, uh, embarked on kind of reflection within the US government and engagement with external actors on this, you know, one of the points I think it's important to recognize is that the surveillance that is done by the U.S. is done for limited purposes. You know, it's essentially done to uh, identify terrorist threats, uh, criminal activity. Yeah. 
but the revelations in the news, I mean, I don't indicate that the surveillance is for anything but those purposes. So um, uh, that's the first point, and I think that is very different from the sort of surveillance that takes place in a China or a Vietnam or another place where the surveillance when, is. When the, when the yeah, I just just very quick, and then over to you. Weren't the revelations just only two days ago in Le Monde that um, senior French business figures and politicians uh, were having their phones listened to? So that's surely they they're not potential terrorists. Perhaps so, they are. So I, I I should I should add to that. So some of the surveillance is classic spy stuff that all governments do in terms of trying to find out what each other you know is thinking, is planning, is that sort of thing. So that, that falls into a different category than some of these other things. But I do think you can distinguish uh, what the US has done from what China has done. I, I would li like to think that if you don't. Uh, let me, let me just, uh, so wait, before we come to the next question, uh, uh, Zahid. Yeah, I just wanted to sort of say, um, I know this is an extremely challenging issue. I mean, uh, you know, it's, 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 I, I, you've got this US government official saying something, and we know what we've read in the press. And all of us have our very crystallized views about what it was. Um, I'm not going to get into that debate, but I'm going to say something different. Every country in the world, as far as my understanding, even in ours, and we're, we're facing it in where, where I live, is conducting espionage. And it's conducting espionage on the basis of content. And I think the only distinction that one can possibly make, really, apart from the espionage, that the fact that you spy on everybody else, is what you do with your own people. That's the only distinction between everybody that I think one can try to make in, within, within whether it's China, US, or others. And that depends on the regulation and law that you have within your own country. And I'm only talking about your own citizens. I'm not going to get into the debate about other people's citizens because, you know, does that matter? I mean, does, does one country have a responsibility to the citizens of another country? Does India have a responsibility to the citizens of Pakistan? I, I'm not going to get into that debate. But a country does have responsibility to, this, to its own citizens. And it does set standards and laws as to what it does with its own citizens. And as a matter of best practice, you've got to ask yourself, what does America represent? What does the UK represent? What does China, Pakistan, India, or any other country represent? And ask yourself, and I think this is what we need to do at some stage, is figure out what is the best practice here? There's bad practice, there's horrible practice taking place, and then there's better practice taking place. And I think it's time that we had this open discussion, that we had this discussion, what do you, in your own national country, to your own citizens do, and whether you have the proper safeguards and protections? And when you, when you chalk up that list, you have, ask questions like, Okay, is there a legislation under which you're doing this? What are the controls that you have? Is there a court and judicial oversight that you have over this or not? And I think you'll be pretty easily then be able to sort of say, well, this is the good practice, or maybe it can be improved, and then this is the terrible practice. And I think that's also an important discussion. And I think I don't want to be distracted by this thing. Espionage is espionage. It's been going on for a long time. I'm not going to get into that debate because no one's going to win that one. But this is something we can talk about, and I would suggest that we talk about it in an international fora. And coming to, and just closing this point, that's why I think what the one takeaway I'd like people to walk away from here is where can we discuss this in coalition, these issues? One, the deliberalization that is causing the same effect, that is causing and enabling the thing we're talking about. And second, where can we talk about the better practice when you deal with your own citizens? Thank you. That's a very good question, very good challenge. But let's, let's move on. There are a lot of questions. A lot of people want to ask questions, and there's lots of opportunity to go back to this issue and many others. Gentlemen there. Yeah. Yeah. Mr. Gaines. Yeah. Just, um, it should be on. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for giving me the floor. I'm a, a delegate from the Chinese delegation. I want to briefly react to what has been said by the distinguished representative uh, from the US uh, State Department. I think he should have followed the good example of the Indonesian uh, presenter who started, you know, to deal with, to talk about, deal about their own, um, uh, I mean, uh, uh, problems because you, you, you know much better about your own problems. Instead, he started to call the names of a group of developing countries, whether it's China, whether it's Vietnam, whether it's Cuba, you know, Arab Spring. It's, it's, it's a typical, I mean, a practice of a double standard. You should have started with the state surveillance. 
which, which has been a topic, a hot topic during this, uh, um, I mean, IGF, the whole set from the day one. So that's rather instead of finding reasons, excuses, and take talk it so lightly, we're trying to find solutions. I agree with one of the panelists. It, it, is, it is not the US government which has taken the initiative to find solutions, to admit this, because it, it has been reviewed and you started, you had to admit. Okay, this is one point. Let me, I have another point. I just wanted to react to what has been said about cracking or striking on the rumor spreading, uh, uh, spreading on, uh, online. Spreading rumor, whether, you know, I mean, offline or online, will be dealt, I mean, if it causes a serious concerns, it will be dealt with in accordance with the law in any country, including China. By the way, this, this practice is, I mean, supported by a regulation which has been promulgated by the Supreme Court and the Supreme Inspector's Office. So we are talking about the rule of, uh, rule, rule of law. Of course, we admit that probably, you know, we, all, we need all to look at our own problems. If there are deficiencies, we need to find ways to improve. So we admit that we are not perfect, but on the other hand, we always say you have to take in the mirror and look yourself into it, whether you are clean or not. Thank you. Um, thank you. I, I will um, just ask Scott to respond to, to your uh, challenge briefly, but uh, it may be of interest to you that I've just... Um, uh, come from two days of discussions in Beijing um, on these very issues um, and um, many a Chinese delegate was keen to impress upon me the perils of irrational and irresponsible opinion, um, both of which should be punished. Um, Scott. No, I mean, I'm happy to discuss U.S. practices in this. I think we already have talked about that. Uh, there's no question there's room for improvement in the U.S. President Obama's appointed a review board to look at our policies on surveillance and try to strike an appropriate balance between security and privacy and freedom of expression. So we're embar we've embarked on that process now. Our hope is that by the end of the year, uh, we will have in place certain reforms to the process that will improve the sort of judicial, legislative, and other types of oversight that we have. In the case of China, our understanding, for instance, on this rumor, mongering provision that it's, a, that it's used not only to curtail uh, rumors, but also uh, those who are spreading information that's critical of the government. And we think that's an uh, illegitimate restriction on freedom of expression. Thank you. Um, thank you. There, but these mics keep on cutting out. Um, there were two ladies there, and I don't know if they've gone, um, but they had question, hands up at the back. But anyway, um, there, but I do emphasize to people not to, uh, not every question so to... I'll, I'll, I'll share the other mic there, so that we only... Okay, have fine. Can we have two, two different mic people then? Uh, okay, um, yeah. Yes, hi. I think you were going to say not every question and perhaps address to the U.S. delegate, but yeah. this will be another one. So. Yeah. All right, we, um, but, but we will have a quota. Okay. <laughs> Um, so I'm Mariana Javier. I'm based in Toronto with IFEX. We're a global network of groups that promote defend free expression. Um, I don't know if my colleague is here from the Committee to Protect Journalists, but they recently published. Sorry. Oh, uh, the Committee to Protect Journalists in New York recently published a very interesting report on Obama's relation with the press, and it was uh, I should quote directly from it because I think. Further than the surveillance issue, it talks very strongly about the access to information issue. It mentions U.S. President Barack Obama office pledging open government. has fallen short on this promise. Journalism and transparency at the White House curbs. Journalists and transparency advocates say the White House Sorry. Uh. Curbs routine disclosure of information and exploits its own media to evade scrutiny by the press. So I thought that was important to, to highlight here because it's a longer you know, history of access to information, related surveillance. Yes, there is the review board for surveillance, but what about this much broader issue when I think a country fears a discussion, an open discussion of, with awareness among its own people, I, there's a real concern then, you know, given the post 9-11 world and everything. But, you know, I, my opinion would be that 
further discussion, open discussion, access to information would aid us rather than in, impede us. So thank you. That, one. Uh, th that point's noted and we'll, we'll incorporate it into um, later discussion. Right, who was the next hand? There was somebody here with a hand up. Yeah, right here in, uh, I'll, I'll, no, here. Oh yeah, okay, yeah, go there, yeah. Yeah, fine. And Hi. <laughs> I have a question for Google, um, Project Shield. Um, I have a couple of questions, so I hope they're not too technical. The first one is, are you going to be doing ASP protection? Are you doing PHP and ASP coded sites? That's the first one. The second one is, um, I read up on it a little bit, and I, I want you maybe to elaborate more on the how free this service is now and in the future. And if you could talk a little bit about proprietary closed code, which I guess this is. Um, those were the two main things, thank you. Thanks, I should uh, preface anything I say by saying I'm not a technical person. So there'll, there'll be, uh, <laughs> I'll be limited of use of, with that. I think the other thing to say is that it is very new. And so it's still being developed. Uh, it's not uh, something that uh, Google has done just itself, but it's working with, with others to, to do that. So um, uh, to be honest, I think the best thing is to read up online where we will post most of those ideas on the Google Ideas site um, and follow that. And if you have particular questions, I'm very happy to uh, take them and follow up afterwards. But I'm afraid I can't offer any additional technical detail at this time. I'll, I'll see what I can get for you if we meet afterwards. Hi, I'm Andres Aspurua from Venezuela. I'm um, part, part of the ISAC ambassadors. I also wanted some elaboration on Project Shield, but since that was already answered, uh, I would like to know some, some of the panelists' opinions on action of privates coordinated or promoted by governments that contribute to this the censorship climate um, to attacks to on, for example, the kind of sites that need Project Shield itself, and in the end, contributing to this, uh, the title of the of, of the session, the this what was the word uh, oppression online. Yeah, I think I'm not quite sure if it's I'm the the the, the best seated person here to answer that question. But what I would like to say about that, it's that you I mean this is political, and in a political realm, you need to figure out how to solve it in a different kind of layers. And um, uh, as for civil society, uh, of as or from a civil society perspective, I will say we need to. Uh, not just, you know, to have a, the traditional agenda of the thing, which is, you know, interchange ideas, uh, exchange, uh, what Sahid said, like pr best practices and stuff. But I think it's important, too, to just uh, have a look, a closer look about what is happening in within the region, right? I mean, in the case of Latin America, for instance, the case of Venezuela is quite complicated, as such, the case of Ecuador, for instance, and with other... Uh, cases where you have uh, not just traditional kind of surveillance or traditional kind of, of uh, problems from freedom of expression problems, I say, but uh, you can see a trend there, a very preoccupant trend, especially when you see uh, other kind of problem related with, uh, for instance, um, human rights uh, justice in the inter American system, for instance, and the problems that uh, Ecuador uh, Venezuela or even Brazil, which is you know uh, not providing the, the, the enough funds for the inter-American uh, human rights system to just work in better. So I think the problems are in a different layers, and it depends of each one of the you know of the uh, of the institutions related uh, what to, to what to do. Um, Donny, I was wondering, can you provide briefly um, a perspective uh, f with regard to ASEAN? So, um, actually, in Indonesia, in internet service providers in Indonesia, uh, uh, license is come from the government. So, the uh, ISP have to follow any direction or order from the government. Uh, so, it's like uh, it's like a basic for 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 Indonesia because we have uh, IGF 2013 right now in Indonesia. So, it pushed 
all the stakeholders to sit together to to uh, to uh, prepare the IGF. So, because the IGF, because the Internet Governance Forum, then we develop we call it Indonesian Internet Governance Forum, which is content of which consists of the civil society, private sector, and government. In short term, we we just talk about uh, the preparation for the IGF, but actually parallelly. Uh, we also talk about several issues that related to the to the to the uh, to the uh, uh, policy, uh, also for the drafting uh, policy drafting. So we believe that I'm from civil society, so we believe that some significant problems in Indonesia, for example, like the censorship or defamation online article or or um, surveillance, is based on the, on the not. Uh, proper governance. So we believe on dialogue. So while we are preparing this IGF, we sit together and sometimes we talk about, well, we sometimes the civil society can formal, informally talk with government. Well, this policy is maybe it's not right. So it's like, like a top, uh, uh, top down uh, uh, lobby. Some civil society in Indonesia are not so happy with that approach. They still believe that the the the, the movement start, uh, have to be start from from the grassroots. But we we we, we also uh, do from from also from from the engagement from the multi stakeholders. I just want to remind um, folks that on on the um, the agenda we were also talking about the intersection of the internet telecommunications and human rights. And we've got Liesl here from uh, the industry dialogue, uh, the new coordinator. We also have Eve from uh, Orange uh, France Telecom, who's the uh, uh, rotating chair of uh, the industry dialogue um, for the telcos. Are there any questions now um, or coming up uh, specifically with regard to telcos? Uh, and I'd like to go to them first, just so as we get some balance here in about the, the third or fourth row, and then we'll come back to the guy, guy in the white shirt at the back. Thank you. Um, Nicola Zingales from Team University in the Netherlands. Um, I'm interested in the issue of accountability of uh, uh, telecom uh, companies. And um, one of the things that strikes me about this um, initiative of the Global Network Initiative and also the Telco Action Plan is that they set out a number of uh, interesting and um, well-balanced principles. Uh, and as usual, principles are, are very good in, in principle, in fact. But then I w I'm wondering how, uh, to what extent they are followed up in practice. And Specifically, I'm interested in what would be the consequences if one of the companies involved in this initiative doesn't abide by the principles. Sure, thanks for the question. Um, part of the uh, guiding principles that the companies have adopted is the commitment to report externally every year on how each company is implementing these principles into their actions, into their activities. Um, and this coming year will be the first year in which every company publishes as part of their annual report um, a section on how each of these principles is being implemented. Um, almost all of the companies also have um, a, an assurance process of their corporate uh, social responsibility reports so that an independent auditor comes and examines whether or not what they say is actually being done. And so that um, is kind of an extra point for accountability. Um, but also dialogue um, in a multi-stakeholder environment is a natural form of accountability. And so um, taking part in conversations with governments and with civil society and with uh, customers is an important part of that as well. Guy in the white shirt at the back who had his hand up. Thank you. Hello. Uh, this is um, also addressed to the gentleman from Google. Um, I'm Gerard Harris. I'm with a, a not-for-profit tech firm from Canada called Equality. So it's a very simple question. Since um, see, there's a lot of 
uh, anger and mistrust against the US government, and so why should we all trust the US government with our data? Can you tell me um, why would human rights activists and uh, investigative journalists trust a large corporation in collusion with the American government? Well, I'm, I'm so glad you asked an objective question there, um, rather than loading it with, with any terms. Um, I, I think, uh, firstly, uh, you know, uh, the, I, I would say, firstly, there's a session tomorrow. Uh, is it tomorrow or Friday on surveillance? So a lot of these issues will be discussed there. Secondly, um, we have stated very clearly uh, that there is no back door, side door, any other door. Uh, thirdly, I'd say we also produce, well, we're the first company to produce transparency reports. Um, I'm not sure if telcos have, have gone that far yet, but you can look at those and they will say how many requests we get and how many we fill. And we're actually taking the US government to court right now um, in the Foreign Intelligence uh, Surveillance Court to increase transparency. So I think... Uh, there are a range of actions we're taking. In terms of the security of your data, um, we take that very, very seriously. Um, that's not only a point of principle, it's a point of commercial interest, uh, and those uh, both apply, and that's why uh, we have uh, pretty strong protections, um, and those are all available to, to look at online. And then... I'm actually so glad that these kind of questions about whether you should trust the U.S. government or, you know, corporations that are Western, et cetera, is, are coming up. What I'd also suggest while we do that is use that as an opportunity to also flatten this discussion. Flatten, I mean equalize. Because say there's a company from the West that is supplying, like in Pakistan, NetSweeper was supplied for doing surveillance. Well, um, we'll stop them. Okay, then what? Uh, you'll have a Chinese or a Russian company be asked to assist, and they'll come in, and the problem doesn't get solved. The problem needs to be solved where we can actually flatten this issue at a global level, where we can find a mechanism at some forums where we say, this issue needs to come up, and every country and providers connected to them need to now be responsible, or we have to have a mechanism that can, that can actually address this. And I think that would be, I think, something that hopefully, if we can do that, will actually give dividends to the kind of rights we're trying to protect. Um, my question is to the gentleman from Google. <laughs> He's getting almost as many. <laughs> Sorry. Um, your motto is don't be evil. And uh, Gmail has become where email of the world is stored. I want to ask you, are you going to make strong encryption usable in Gmail? And will you agree that users' email will be encrypted by passwords that the users control? Those decisions are far above my pay grade. Uh, but I would say that um, I, I'm not sure if you're aware that, that Gmail has, um, uh, I think in the last year, uh, activated a service under which you will be notified if uh, we become aware that you are subject of a state-sponsored attack and that comes up as a flag, uh, and we are reasonably confident that our systems can identify that. So that is ex an existing tool on Gmail today. Uh, in terms of encryption, um, there are certain uh, levels of encryption already, uh, but in terms of the technical details, I'd, I'd have to look into that and come back to you. Um, right, there was a question, yep, there at the back. Uh, uh, try, is, is, it, is it to the State Department or Google? No. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> then you may ask it. Uh, Narelle Clark, um, President of the Internet Society in Australia. Um, my question is to the uh, telco rep. Be uh, on, on the topic of um, uh, internal training programs in order to ensure that staff uh, comply with the sorts of appropriate processes and principles that should be in place when surveillance operations are taking place, my own observation is, and I am a telco engineer and have spent many years in the, in the business, that the move away from, uh, you won't hear this often, but the move away from traditional telco practices does mean that we do seem to be losing some of those well entrenched good practices with um, behaving better towards surveillance activities. 
Would you care to comment on what, that? Can you just define what you mean by behaving better towards surveillance <laughs> activities? Um, preserving the secrecy of um, the uh, the materials which are under intercept, for example. So I think we have we have started to see some leakage of material uh, and and um, the things that people have been intercepting. Um, I'll try and put that in a more coherent way. It's a very long day. <laughs> uh, that um, one of the issues with surveillance is that unauthorised, unlawful access can be made quite readily. Once you install that capability, what's to stop the evil ex-partner or the, you know, the nasty person from getting access to it? Um, I, I'm not quite sure how to answer that question, but I, I mean, precisely because of these issues, the, um, the guiding principles for the telecommunications industry dialogue were drafted, and they do include um, a portion on training, that training is crucial to um, making sure that these policies that the companies adopt um, are reflected across their operations. Um, and these are definitely conversations that uh, we want to continue having. And, and your observation is, is noted. Thank you for that. And perhaps. Uh, just, I'm going to farm that question also out to, to Eve from uh, Orange France Telecom, who might be able to answer that, as well as putting another point. Um, yeah. Um, as telco, we, we do operate in countries where we are part of the country, meaning we have uh, a few hundred to few thousand people sitting in the country and we have a few billion dollars of equipment sitting in the country. And that's pretty different from an internet company who, who can uh, make his business uh, from outside the country. Uh, so we live with the country, we are subjected to uh, enforcement from the governments uh, of these countries. Um, so that's why we we constructed the idea basically to be transparent. Uh, we've been forced in all the Arab uh, revolutions that, that just happened, we've been forced to do things we didn't want it to do. Um, Basil mentioned Egypt, but there are quite a few others where we were asked to shut down, to filter, to, to, to send even SMS messages. And, um, and this was done sometime with the gun uh, in front of our CEO face. So uh, one of the principles that uh, was mentioned by Lizel is our first priority, whatever happened, is to try to save the life of our people on the field. And, and that's why we uh, do things we don't want to do. That, but now we, we, we are trying to put some transparency into that and then again, we are facing the government when it could be uh, unlawful to be transparent. We could talk about uh, uh, Egypt because the government is gone. So we said that we were forced to send SMS. We asked the government to, to sign the SMS and uh, everybody was happy we could say it. We had to do it, but we could say that we had to do it and that was a huge step toward transparency. But again, we could do it because um, the government is gone. So that's why we're together at the ID. We're trying to open our dialogue to governments so that we uh, will not be at the long road, but we will not be uh, forced to do things. And if we are for, uh, well, I don't know if we'd say government security or government uh, uh, um, interest, and we should really debate what is government security and what is government interest. If we can find our way between the two within the ID and have an open discussion, we'd go forward and, and do it. That's the best we can do. At least um, uh, Google said that uh, they emit a transparency report and that we do not. I'm not sure uh, we are yet allowed to do it. We will try, as Lizel said, to report in our CSR, report everything we're doing this year. Uh, there were very few things to report before, before the source Northern League, before all these events. But from, from what I remember, uh, Google had also a transparency report before the Snowden League. And, and of course, I mean, there is transparency report and transparency report. So we'd like to make sure that what we can do, we can do it and that we can be transparent. 
and and before giving um, uh, the mic to the mic to Mike um, at Index, um, the, one of the tasks facing the GNI's um, associative work um, with the industry dialogue is reconciling the, the differences between ISPs and, and telcos, the differences in the historic legacies, in the extent to which, by the nature of the work, telcos, uh, through their old sort of nationalized landline histories, were sort of embedded with governments, and the technical differences bet between the two different sectors. There's a lot of work to see how far um, that sort of cooperation and collaboration can go. Um, Mike. So there's the word oppression in the title of this, uh, uh, the title of this workshop. So we know why the Chinese delegates have turned up. They've turned up because they thought that with the word oppression in the title, we would be talking about China. We would be talking about your legions of state censors. We would be talking about the fact that freedom is virtually non-existent in China. The fact that you're rounding up your leading bloggers. The fact that many of your most talented individuals have fled, such as Ai Weiwei. That's why you, you're here, and that's why you thought you'd participate in this debate. But I tell you what, it's incredibly depressing watching the Chinese lecture the US government on mass surveillance. It's an incredibly depressing sight to watch where we've got the, you know, the major, major leading nations of the world all engaging in gross, systematic mass surveillance. And at the IGF, we've got to say, this is where we draw the line. We've got to hold our democratic uh, governments accountable. We've got to say, we know what the best practice is. The best practice is executive oversight judicial oversight, and jury saying, yes, you can survey this individual, or no, you can't survey this individual. I think we've also got to get involved in legal warfare. We've got to say, as civil society, where governments, uh, where governments are surveying us, we've got to have judicial challenges to that. But we've also got to challenge corporations. It's good that corporations are taking their corporate social responsibility a lot more seriously than they were a few years ago. And we've seen that post-Arab Spring. But companies also have responsibility where they are put under pressure by states to use every means they have at their disposal, including legal warfare, to push back. And maybe they would only push back for 24 hours, maybe it'd be 48 hours, but it just shows states that they cannot act with impunity the whole time. Just very briefly, I wanted to say I obviously agree with everything that's been said, and I think that you know uh, we need to think about. And I'd like to ask a question actually to everybody and even the panel. So where do we go from here? We all agree on this. I don't think there's anybody who disagrees. We have to flatten. We have to find a way that we address these issues. But where do we address it by just um, you know having workshops and discussing it, or do we take it somewhere? And the question is, should this if, because everything else came to the ITU? Should this be an issue that should come to the ITU? Should it be an issue that should be on the main panel next time at the IGF? I don't know, but you know, where should it be discussed? Any ideas, guys? Right. Let's have some more questions, and then that that's a good challenge for uh, participants when I ask them in a few minutes' time for their summing up remarks. Yeah, at the back. <laughs> Uh, yeah, my name is uh, Sridhi Prayamaji. I'm, uh, I'm a blogger and activist. Uh, my question is related uh, to Google. Uh, Google is currently harvesting in uh, click patterns um, of its user and commercializing its prospects. Uh, and with all the surveillance uh, going on, uh, do you think I should feel secure that my data will, uh, will not be used against me? You know? Just a general question. What was the last few words not be used for? Uh, being a user, do you think I should feel secure that my data will not be used against me? So uh, our interest, both in a principal sense and a commercial sense, is to keep your data safe, and it is your data. If we are requested under legal processes um, that are robust um, and uh, according to rule of law to disclose that, then we're obliged to do so. And, and that's the way the law works. Uh, so that's presumably answering your question. Um, right, we've got time for a few more questions. Um, having um, uh, r sort of ask people to uh, diversify. Um, they've they've more gone uh, to Ross than they've gone to Scott. So feel free to um, feel free to uh, 
to spread them far and wide um, as, as you wish? Or are we running up against up some time? Okay, so if, if that's what we are, let, let's, let's rise to Zahid's challenge. It's easy to complain what in practical terms, whether it comes to specific uh, asks or requirements of corporations or governments, or whether it is in multi-stakeholder and other international forums, what is the best way for um, encapsulating? Um, we've got the GNI, which holds companies to account, has civil society organizations such as Human Rights Watch, such as Index, um, uh, part of it, and, and is growing and is now uh, beginning to explore collaboration uh, with the telcos. So that's uh, on one level. How do we um, bring it to um, an international fora? Which are the best international fora, and how is it best done, particularly not just in a uh, critical complaining way, but in a practical way to achieve um, results? Who wants to take that um, challenge on first? Uh, it's a pretty difficult question, actually, to answer, and because it's obviously, obviously easy to just point out of what, what the problems are. But um, I will say one of the most important things that we can do, actually, is raising up uh, the what are the human rights standards that can apply. And this is a very general thing, right? I mean, this is a very general standard, and we've heard about it a lot. But uh, as well as what's happening with the with the word balance when we're talking about copyright. Several times when we're talking about uh, human rights standards, we don't have a very clear idea about what we're talking about when we're talking about human rights standards. So I think it's important to just take into account what our human rights jurisprudence has said when you have that kind of things, like in Latin American, uh, inter-American human rights system, for instance. And therefore, just try to figure out how that is standards that apply to gross human rights, for instance, freedom of expression as such, can apply or not to just set different standards to the internet. I'm not, uh, I'm not saying nothing, you know, uh, brand new, but I think it's quite important to just try to figure out that this is the criteria. The criteria are not the practices. The criteria are not, you know, the best practices that companies can handle. The criteria that we need to, uh, to use uh, as a starting point is what our, our human rights experience uh, in the last 40 or 5, 50 years have been said about it. Answer my own question? Well, look, you know, they're, they're, they're okay. Um, you could take it. Oh, God, no. I, I didn't know. I was just thinking, well, we need, we need to do something about it. Let's not just crib. You know, everybody wants to shout and scream. We've heard that a lot, actually, this week. But what do we do about it? Um, well, the two things. One, you take it to the ITU. We had something happening earlier, like last year. You take the issues to the ITU, all sorts of issues. Some of them would be sort of said, let's not do that. And maybe the idea is that it goes there so it does get rejected. Maybe that's the news piece. Maybe that's the media. And to see who actually rejects it might be one way to do it. Or the other way would be, at the very least, the next IGF. This should be, because I know that this issue was actually shuck, struck off from being anywhere close to the main session of the IGF. Maybe the idea is to have it discussed at the next IGF. Maybe that's another way to do it. But I can only think of these two ways. The third mechanism, which is not necessarily international convention or covenants, but is to have the Freedom Online Coalition and others get together and say that we as countries as a caucus have made this decision that not only would we, but basically our subordinates in those countries will not be subjected to these sort of things. And we will put the weight of the US, the European Union, and other governments behind this issue. Maybe that's one way to do it. Which is a perfect cue to say um, that the GNI is convening a meeting in Brussels um, with Freedom Online uh, governments and others in November. It's the start um, uh, of that, and and hopefully, yeah. I mean, uh, if you if 21 countries and more are holding themselves up as uh, leaders, uh, self-professed leaders in a field, then they have to be held to higher standards at le um, as others. Um, Liesel, do you want to um, uh, offer some uh, GNI industry dialogue and other thoughts? Sure, I, I think that um, Claudio made a really good point that um, at the end of the day when we talk about freedom of expression and privacy, um, we're talking about concepts that are established in international law and particularly in international human rights law. And so the conflict that, um, that we often face is what happens when uh, domestic law 
is not necessarily consistent with um, international law and the standards that countries have held themselves to. And um, what do companies do in these situations is the question that, that we are trying to answer. And um, any forum in which we can dialogue with um, international actors, having those standards um, inform, our, inform our discussion, I think, will be a valuable forum. Yeah, uh, for especially for the Indonesian cases, you know, the most important is uh, uh, to to increase the uh, the engagement of the civil society to the to, to any dialogue. Say it could be the local or regional or international. But the most important is we have to increase the engagement of the civil society. But the most important, the, the most most important is uh, to create capacity building of the civil society itself because we have. Actually, we have a slight challenge on the civil society in, in, in Indonesia when we are talking about the internet governance, when we are talking about the telecommunication issues. So only a few of the civil society that understand or could be uh, 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 invited by the government. When we, talk about, when we talk to government about why don't you invite more civil society to be engaged on the uh, policy uh, drafting, policy making, or any related to the uh, freedom of uh, freedom of expression through the uh, policy, and the government said that. Well, actually, we want to invite the civil society, but we don't know which one is which one is could be invited. So, the challenge in Indonesia is still is the civil society. So, um, uh, when we are civil society ready, then we, we, any dialogue from the local, regional, and international could be. Um, very useful, unless it will, it will be uh, uh, give uh, uh, nothing but only a talking and talking. Thank you. Some practical issues. Oh, practical. Uh, oh, God, what do you do about practical issues? Um, well, I think that, uh, you know, as I said at the beginning, forums like the IGF are incredibly important. Um, secondly, I've talked about legal warfare and upholding. Um, upholding corporate responsibility, upholding state responsibility. Um, I do also think that on a grander, in the grander scheme of things, we need more legal protection for whistleblowers. Um, I still think there's a problem that very few states globally have protections in their constitutions, have legal protections for whistleblowers. Unless we have that, we can't really push, uh, we can't really uh, push forward and, and argue convincingly for freedom of expression. Um, finally, I think we're starting to get a clearer idea of global benchmarks around freedom of expression and of privacy. A lot of work's been done on uh, appropriate measures for takedown of content, appropriate measures for takedown of copyrighted content. Um, we're starting to see the emergence of global standards. I think the next part is the actual implementation of those standards. And we need a lot of civil society pressure so that we move quickly on this and we don't wait another 10 years for companies to have proper implementation of, of these guidelines. Because all too often, it might not be the most egregious case, but you know, for example, defamation laws and the takedown of content due to defamation laws, huge problem internationally. We're starting to see solutions in guidelines. We need them implemented. Uh, Ross, I just wanted to ask you, uh, what is your chosen, what is your preferred international forum for dealing with these issues? What about Zahid's um, uh, point, which is throwing it at the ITU as a challenge, as a challenge, again, challenge towards its bona fides so far? Um, Western governments and, and some corporations have been reluctant to do that. So anyway, tell us which you think are the best public mechanisms for airing these dis and airing these problems in a not in so much in a rhetorical way, but in a practical way that delivers results. Uh, that's that's always a significant challenge with international institutions. Um, uh, I think it, it depends on the nature of the problem, um, and it depends on what you're trying to address. 
I think respectful engagement is incredibly important and um, actually spending time to listen and understand different perspectives, as cliched as that sound uh, sounds, is actually vital because that's how we understand different perspectives and, and come to a collective solution. And that's why you know, there, there is importance to multi-stakeholderism um, in that sense. I'd also say on a practical basis, um, you know, there are internet tools that are available, but also I'd invite you, you know, if you see practical tools that you feel we should be doing or other private companies should be doing, let us know. Um, that's important for us to hear from people that use our services. So that's a dialogue as well, I think, between business and, and uh, those that use our services that's particularly important um, in this context as well. Um, Scott, just bef before coming to you as final thoughts, I mean, in, in some of the uh, writings and other things I, I've done since PRISM, one of the great sadnesses I, I've felt is the extent to which um, the uh, surveillance that has been revealed has undermined the good work um, that governments and others have been doing on the positive side, on the freedom of expression side, in terms of the credibility of the actors. Uh, now, in amongst the question about uh, Zahid's challenge about forums, can you begin to answer the question about how do you, beyond words, how do you begin to restore the credibility of the external free expression uh, work that is being done, or will that just be, uh, in time, a victim uh, of of the revelations. Thanks, John. Well, as I alluded to before, I mean, I think it's time for the United States to get its own house in order. I think that's going to be key uh, to our own credibility. It's going to be key, I think, to the international debate uh, on these issues, uh, and that's what I think we're we're trying to do. Um, I like Saeed's idea of of getting the Freedom Online Coalition engaged on the issue, uh, and more broadly, I think the notion that like-minded governments and entities and individuals coming together around a set of principles uh, and approach on these issues is, is what uh, needs to happen. Uh, I'd be very reluctant to have this discussion debate in a state-centered organization like the ITU, or for that matter, the, U, uh, the UN itself, because I don't think you're going to end up with an outcome that uh, is going to be best for human rights. So, Thank you. Okay, uh, well, we've had a large panel. Um, I'm grateful to the panelists for keeping their opening remarks brief so that we were able to, uh, to engage in um, uh, a pretty full-on uh, dialogue, uh, all of us together. There's, there's many more panels and other discussions on these issues. Um, so if you could just um, thank the panel and thank you all for attending and enjoy your evening. Thank you.